Okay, well, welcome to the Portland Urban Beekeepers monthly meeting. And my name is Cheryl Wright. I'm the um, president of the Portland Urban Beekeepers. And uh, this is our October meeting. So I just wanted to extend a, a reason why we should all continue to uh, participate and join the Portland Urban Beekeepers. And we have free library books that includes um, other things such as uh, candle molds and uh, DVDs. We have equipment rental, which includes our manual and motorized extractors, a refractometer, uh, observation hive, frame jigs. We have a great swarm list. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, we have our bee buddy connections, which I'll go over briefly. And um, we have free beekeeping <clears throat> opportunities at our club apiary. So support our mission and join us on Facebook, which you can do for free. Um, and it's just $25 a year and it's just 25 dollars and it's just 25 dollars so, can everybody make sure that you've muted your everybody um make sure that you've muted your i got you eric i just muted you okay so our elections are coming up uh, we're going to use the entire month of November. Uh, and how this is going to work is we're going to send you a Google form and each person will be allowed to vote once and that will be confirmed by the email address that we have on file for you. So that's why we're going to ask you to put your email address in, the, uh, in this form so that we can count you. And uh, it's really important that we all vote. There's over 200 members. And last year's vote, maybe everybody was upset about COVID, but we need to vote. So, you know, we, we hold on to these results. This is all per our constitution and our bylaws. So we're required to hold on to these, um, these votes for uh, two years. So we need a good participation. Again, it should be completely effortless. It will be sent to you in an email, you click on it, and then you just click your choice. And these are our officer candidates um, for president. It will be Ian Horvath. And um, hold on, I have to go mute somebody else here. Okay. Um, Vice President, Jana Patterson. Secretary Treasurer will be Brian Fackler. Librarian will be Katie Fackler. Our apiary manager will be Bruce Kester. Communications will be Jess Anderson. And then for a member at large, it will be a write-in. So you can write yourself in if you want or write in someone who you think would be a good candidate. But what the member at large does is they basically help to field um, complaints, concerns, questions, and things of this nature. So it's uh, in this um, environment of Zoom, it's a fairly um, non-intense way to be on the board. Uh, and then you get to uh, participate in our meetings and uh, that will um, give you a sense of like what we do. So in case that you're interested in becoming someone more involved, you'll have a, a sense of what's going on on the board. So it's a nice, easy way to be introduced. So our um, participants or our, um, our candidates for president and vice president will be Ian. Can people please mute? So I would ask each of these people to go ahead and read their statements, but we're a little bit pressed for time. Um, so you can read their statements. Ian, um, he's... Uh, in the Organ Master Melatology Program, which is a study of all bees. And that's with the Organ Master Beekeeper Program. And he's going to foster a collaborative environment to where new and experienced beekeepers can freely exchange information while continuing to deliver the monthly speakers relevant to our needs as a community. Um, he's been keeping bees for nearly a decade and currently maintains several colonies and has a strong focus on educating the public on the importance of beekeeping and pollinators in the ecosystem and the intersection with our food supply. And Jana is a relatively new beekeeper, 
and she would be running for vice president, but she has extensive board experience that she can bring to our board. And uh, as she worked with the largest Girl Scout day camp in Oregon, she recently uh, closed her dog training business. So now she has time to dedicate to pub. Uh, she had her first newt this May and she's completely captivated with all things B and completed pubs B school 2021. She's been reading a lot of books and she was just um, accepted into the Oregon Master Beekeeper program at the apprentice level. So congratulations to Jana for that. Uh, the Oregon State Beekeepers uh, will be having their annual meeting at, in Florence, Oregon and it will be zoomed so you have the choice to go down and enjoy the coast uh, or you can stay at home and watch it on your couch october 22nd 23rd and 24th as uh because we are a, 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 a member of oregon state beekeepers as a club Every year they offer us one scholarship for a pub member. And this covers your registration fee, which is about $150. So if you're interested, email me at the president uh, at the portlandurbanbeekeepers.org. And the uh, first person who, email, who emails me with a yes, I want it, I will send it to you. You need to fill it out and you need to submit the form before Friday. It was tight. Uh, this is really tight notice. I appreciate that. But we were just notified of this like yesterday. So it's been tight all the way around. But anyway, so it's three days of really interesting information by people from all over the country and sometimes all over the world. Uh, it's worthwhile going. I've gone for the last three years and it's really made a difference, I think, in how I understand beekeeping. Okay, our apiary work parties at Green Anchors will be suspended until March 2022, and then they will resume at the first and third Sundays, and we'll let you know when that happens. Uh, the bees are all tightened up and put to bed for the winter. They're all happy. We have our two Langstroths, uh, which are doing very well. We harvested um, honey from them this year. We had a couple of supers, and I think that we donated 64 or maybe 40 maybe it's 40 16 ounce jars of honey uh, to Stone Soup, which is a, a, a kitchen in downtown Portland that feeds the homeless. And then we also donated 12 16 ounce jars to the Blanchet House, which helps people who have been incarcerated um, get back on their feet. And then Katie Fackler is teaching some of those people how to do beekeeping. So that's what we've done with our honey um, harvest this year. Our Bee Buddy uh, program is in effect. And I know that we go over this slide every month. I just want everybody to log in and just remember that we've had more mentors, we could use more mentors. And also for those of you who just wanna have a friend in beekeeping, this is a great way to um, log on and look at the map and you can see where the mentors are and you can just find somebody in your neighborhood and get in touch with them. When you click on the icon, what comes up is their information, uh, their email address, their address, and you can just connect and meet new people and make new friends. So the honey tasting is still tentative uh, for the for our December meeting, the first, uh, which is going to be the December first. I will let you know and at the at, at November through an email whether or not we're going to do this. The space is reserved. The concern now is just it would be an indoor event, and um, I'm not sure what the pandemic will do, and it will be required that you'll have, I, I think masks will still be required, and I'm not sure how well masking and honey tasting is going to go. So if we don't do the honey tasting in person, we're just going to take December off. So those are the plans. Our after B, school, after B School 2021 recordings are still available. Here are the topics. If you know anybody who would like to get a head start on B School, they can order these recordings for $45, or they can just enroll in next year's B School, which will look very similar and I think will still be on Zoom, along with our in person apiary um, experiences for the B School students. Uh, so do you need a queen or do you want to learn to raise your own? Uh, Steve Gomes is still uh, looking for people to get together to form maybe a queen club or and to learn how to uh, raise queens and workshops that he will be running. So please feel free to contact him either by phone or email. 
Okay, so here we are at the end of, I guess it's the middle of fall. It feels like the end, it's getting darker earlier. So what are our bees doing? Um, right now, uh, you can see that the adult population is, is uh, decreasing as we would expect, and the brood is also decreasing. So we're still in a time when we need to think about treating for Varroa, monitoring for Varroa. Um, but as you can see here in December, when the, this is when the brood is, becomes its lowest, this is the best time to use oxalic acid. Because as we remember, OA does not penetrate under the brood caps. So that's a plan for December. And what are the mites doing? Well, as our population decreases, our mites are going up. So again, this is a critical time to get those mites under control so that we go into spring with a healthy uh, group of bees. And hopefully you've been monitoring and treating since July, since this whole time from um, late summer to fall is uh, the varroa season. Uh, so what should we be doing in our hives in October? Well, we should be looking at our colony strength, uh, checking our queen status, combining weak or queenless colonies. We should be thinking about mouse guards, entrance reducers. We, could sh we uh, need to be weatherizing, thinking about rain guards. If we're going to insulate this year, consider closing our screen bottom boards. Thinking again about varroa mite management and make sure you get your queen, queen excluders out so that um, your bees can have access to their stores uh, through the winter. And again, this is a great varroa mite management decision tool that you can access at honeybeehealthcoalition.org. And it just gives you all the pros and the cons of the different types of treatment. No treatment's right all the time. It's just what works for you and what your situation is. So we talk about reading the frames, and I know that we've been talking about what a really good frame uh, brood pattern looks like. And over here at the bottom is what we like to see in the spring and the summer. Uh, but we talk about the brood uh, contracting. And so when you pull a frame now or later, you're going to see this more compact brood pattern. And that will be normal for this time of year. Again, we don't want to see a spotty pattern like this. So that would suggest our queen may need to be uh, replaced. We still need to be mindful of American fowl brood, remembering that this is a fall disease. And um, in, a, in addition to the distinct odor, you will see these classic and characteristic signs of the scale, which you can see by holding the frame on its edge or on a horizontal plane. And, um, and you can see the greasy cappings, the, the hive will not be thriving. Um, you can see perforations. And again, the smell is the most characteristic thing. Remember that Pub is still offering the AFB, EFB um, task force evaluation. So if you have questions or concerns about what's going on, please feel free to access our website and fill out the form, which will ask a lot of questions and send photos if you can. And then we will get back with you and come and do an in-hive inspection and a test if we think that's indicated for EFB or AFB. But AFB right now is our, mo our main concern. Small hive beetle is also here. We've had several beekeepers in the area report that they um, have actual infections or infestations. So when you pull out your frames, it's just important to remember to look carefully for everything that's on your frame, because if you're not looking for little beetles, you might miss them. And this is what they look like in relationship to the bees. Uh, their larva looks like this, which is very similar to wax moth larva. Um, but we have a nice identification card that's been put out by OSU, and you can uh, grab, a, grab some of these. I'm sure Andony at some point can tell us how to get those, but I'm, Carolyn Brees may have access to them. We need to be careful now because the mice are looking for a nice warm place to stay. And although they are very cute, they do a lot of damage to the bees and the, and the, the structures and the honey. So this is what a nice mouse guard looks like. Very um, difficult for them to get through that. And here are the wax moths that I talked about earlier with the very similar looking larvae to the uh, hive beetle. However, it turns into this 
wonderful little moth. And this is what they look like on a frame. You can see all of the damage. It is not subtle. But I'd like to point out that if you have a really strong colony, this is not going to be a problem. A strong colony can really take care of itself. So what you're seeing here is uh, probably a dead out where the wax moths have moved in and just taken over. So if you see something like this, you have a big problem. Please remember that we do have beneficial pollinators. You don't have to kill everything that looks like it might sting you. Um, so again, know your wasps, know your hornets, and know your beneficial uh, wasps. OK, so I'm going to turn it over to Glenn Andreessen from Bridgetown Bees. And he's going to talk about what our bees are foraging on for nectar and pollen at this time of the year. So Glenn, I have made you co-host. So if you would like to share your screen. And unmute. The host would like you to unmute. Oh, you there. I see you. You're on running on two screens. Gotcha. OK. Yep. yep. Uh, and I don't know why it's uh, it is what it is. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you for uh, talking tonight. Sure. I'm happy to do that. And let's make sure that uh, this is going to go. There we go. All right. I. Uh, you know, of course, this is a real, uh, at least November and December are is a time that there's not a whole lot of things blooming. There are a lot more things blooming in October, but I'm putting them all together here, of course. I also thought that I would uh, go over my honey production because I manage my bees for honey production, hence my uh, great interest in bee plants. And I've been reporting on this since 2017, at least on this slide here. And so what stands out is that I had a pretty good year as far as total weight goes. I had a few more hives that I harvested from. There's probably 20 colonies that I didn't take anything from. The uh, not a great average, you know, certainly better than last year. Uh, but what I like is that <clears throat> not only was my average production weight per super pretty good, but I had just a slightly fewer uh, average supers on per hive, which means less work for me. More honey in a, on uh, fewer frames. That's always a good thing. There weren't any really boomers this year as, as, uh, in my yards. Uh, 155 was the best, which is the worst that I've had in years here. Uh, whoops, uh, pretty good in uh, from a nuke. I, I like to point this out in that beginning beekeepers, or at least any beekeeper starting out with a nuke, can have some pretty good honey production if the, uh, uh, particularly if you're, if all your frames are, are drawn out which of course mine are. So I don't know, I'm kind of a numbers guy. And so I like to see it. Uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer in that if you can measure it, then you can manage it. <laughs> you don't know what you got um, if you don't measure it. So anyway, I, I, I do this one uh, once every year. This is for benefit of the new beekeepers on, on one way that you might uh, consider for cleaning your plastic frames. I don't know if Adoni, I don't think you've ever seen this one. Uh, yeah, you're, you're muted. So I, I can just see what you're saying, but this is a frame that I didn't want to uh, put back in the hive. Uh, as is, there was a lot of scraping, you know, there's a lot of, uh, abandoned cap brood, a lot of mold, other things. And it, of course it was a plastic frame and uh, a wood, uh, excuse me, a wood frame and a plastic foundation. 
And this is my front compost pile. I really do. I've, I have I, seen this. You it's have crazy. seen it? Yeah, I went the last oh. time I was at Pub. Oh, okay. Well, I do it once a year. <laughs> so you've been uh, there at the same time then. But uh, when I first, you know, when I filmed these things here, I have edited it down, but I, I think I need to edit it down even more here so I don't have to be blah, blabbing on and on about it. But compost pile that has, looks a lot better. Uh, let's see, that was 2014, seven years ago than it does now. The compost bin is composting too. So here we are 15 hours later and the Jaws music plays now. What do we have there? Yeah, those are small hive beetles. No, not really. No, they're not. Those are soldier fly larvae. And they're just voracious eaters. Uh, they don't really like the light. And so within minutes, they'll all dive down in there. But just uh, by way of comparison that we know that uh, honeybees are, are in their larval form, which is of course when they eat so much for about six days. And the uh, soldier fly larvae are larvae for about 18 days. So three times as long as honeybees that they need to find something to eat. So we'll move on here to the uh, our main feature now. Uh, not too many flowers going now, uh, annual flowers. There, uh, there might be a few, but not of great import. Uh, but so, still some perennial flowers. Uh, many hummingbird plants there too. Douglas aster is an, is an excellent plant. It does better with supplemental watering if needed. I mean, this was of course a crazy year for any type of plant, but uh, the ones that I did water a little bit did it much better. They, bloom, they bloomed earlier and grew better. So, which stands to reason. And one of my favorite fall plants, a, another aster called Lady in Black, uh, very small flowers, but uh, attractive, and the bees find them re regardless of where they are. More asters. Still blooming nicely. Anemone can be a source, but uh, it's not a major source. Same with echinacea. Uh, some of the salvias are still blooming. <laughs> One of my favorite weeds slash garden plants, mullen. Goldenrod, uh, native plant. Sedums uh, can crawl, especially this, uh, Autumn Joy can crawl with, with honeybees. It's a, a, a great, a great plant. <clears throat> Any more sedums? Thistles, whether weeds or uh, domesticated plants are, are great bee plants. The culture comes now, the fall crocuses are, they've taken a beating with the rain that we've had recently, but they're great uh, when, they, when they first come out in dry weather. Dahlias, oh, I should have, I just dawned on me now, I, I planted a bed of uh, more than a hundred dahlias and I, and I put in some, uh, staked around the edges of it, some six inch diameter real, uh, Oh, I don't know what plastic material. Maybe it's it plastic. We'll call it, and with a six-inch grid, and the the dahlias grow up through it, and then it prevents them from flopping over during the rains. And it's just been great. I've, I've really, I uh, think that's a success. But I'll just point out that it's this colorette classification that is best for honeybees. Uh, many 
dahlias, the centers aren't even visible to uh, insects and available because they're so tight. But generally, they have a uh, uh, a, a series of single petals around it. Here's here's just a few. And I'm presuming that they're getting mostly pollen from this, but uh, Adoni, do you know, are they getting nectar too? He doesn't know. Okay. I, mean, I would it, call I you if I had that question. <laughs> well, it looks like they're diving down to get nectar, but I always see, I also see pollen on their legs frequently uh, after visiting them. So maybe some do and some don't. Many varieties. <clears throat> Some of the hardy fuchsias are, are, will bloom well into next month. The honeysuckles are starting or will be starting in a couple of months. This loquat uh, can be a great plant. Uh, very rarely bears fruit because it doesn't get very well pollinated because of the weather. It's not, not a great time for a fruit plant to be blooming, as you can imagine. The, many of the bra brassicas are, will bloom now if, if you let them. Many shrubs uh, this time of year. I always wait for this one in the neighborhood. I don't have one growing in my, my yard, but uh, this is a new uh, plant to, to the database here. This is a, uh, a type of Mahonia that unlike the ones that you're going to be seeing next that I show you, this one doesn't have real pointy leaves and it blooms now. I took this photo today and it started blooming last month even, uh, just barely. And it's very low growing while others of the Mahonias are, can be very tall. I mean, 10 to 15 feet tall. This one hugs the ground nicely, but this is another uh, Mahoney across native in Ch of China in the Far East. But there, when many things aren't blooming, the, these Mahonias are. Uh, we sometimes call them Oregon grape, but they're, they're not. It's a common name for it. And probably my favorite of these, these Mahonias, the Arthur Menzies, where it can just this foggy day in December, and if the bees are out, the the plant will hum. Must have plenty of, of nectar for them. One of one of my all all time favorites. Viburnums can offer quite a bit. These are pretty common kind of foundation plantings around houses and buildings. Very hardy. Caryopteris uh, can can is still blooming won't be for very much longer. The Wygela. And a few of the crepe myrtles are still out. Not a wonderful bee plant, but not bad. I also educated myself on heaths and heathers and got these photos online here and, and this uh, explanation of these three types, the cross-leaved heath, the bell heather in the middle, and the common heather or ling here. And what I think is noticed, what I noticed is that the ling has petals here as opposed to bells, if you will, like more, these are more like blueberries, which are harder for honeybees to get to, but they can and do, as many of you have uh, sent in photos during the, the uh, through the years here, I don't think either of these people attend anymore, but uh, Lauren and Linda, Susie and Dan. So obviously they do visit these bell-shaped ones, but if you have a choice, the Ling Heathers are, would be the ones to go for. The silverberry, the silverberry, the Eleagnus pungens, uh, so so named because on the underneath side it's it's silver, and they do have a, a berry. Uh, not sure how uh, tasty they are, though. Sochi tea, 
uh, it's a nice looking plant, you know, in October, November, uh, very nice. Uh, not many trees now. The glory bower is on its last legs, uh, as is the Chinese elm and the seven sunflower. I've told people that this is going to be the next bee tree that I plant. Uh, just a wonderful tree, good, nice bark. These blooms and leaves will turn into to red and uh, the bees are just all over them. Not a large tree, but a nice one nevertheless. Some thymes are still out and some uh, oregano's and rosemary and borage. I, I'm almost ready to change this to uh, all 12 months that it can bloom, depending on what the, the weather is for that year. Russian sage still out there and uh, my facilia is, is growing, but it's not blooming uh, with the, new, the new crop. Buckwheat still has a few blooms out though. Once again, the weed mullen, ivy, Dandelions, you know, it's just too bad in some respects that the uh, weeds are so good for our pollinators and whatnot. I like this, just see how that pollen gets transferred from bee to flower or from flower to bee to flower. Butterfly, smart weed, that, okay, that's it. So uh, on the bridge, down bees site there are, there are uh, uh, it's just by the month of October so there's a, a few more there too so uh, don't hesitate at all to send me other photos that you see bees on and we'll add it to the the database which now has uh, I don't know I think about 250 so it's taking shape all right okay Glenn thanks thank you thanks so for the much. opportunity Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And so our next speaker is Anthony, and um, he can share his screen, but I want to give people a little introduction. Dr. Melithopoulos, he works at the Oregon State University as an assistant professor in the, pollina in the, in the pollinator health extension. And um, he is a really uh, uh, a lot of interest, especially in the area of native and managed bees. Um, keeping them healthy and working in natural landscapes. So a major area of his work is on how pesticide applicators, and that sounds like a plastic thing, but I think he's referring to farmers who actually put this stuff on fields, understand the risks associated with pest management decisions. So um, he he's taken a large um, scale assessment of the language of the pollinating insect hazard statements on the pesticide levels and he are on the pesticide labels and he goes out and he talks to the farmers about what this means and it's he thinks it's important and i think it's really important because if any of you have read um, the back of these warnings and labels i mean it, it really can be greek so i think that's one of uh, his big uh, things that he does and why we invited him to do this uh, pesticide talk today he also talks about estimating how these pesticide use practices contribute to pesticide exposure. So um, he does work on residual acute toxicity of insecticides to bees on weathered foliage and flowers and attempts to compare how these residues dissipate relative to the insecticide chemistry in the crop. Uh, he also has been developing a baseline data on the status of both managed and native pollinators to our state. So what he's done is he's partnered with the Oregon State Arthropod Collection in 2017, and he's developed the Oregon Bee Atlas. And he's the first and only extension master certificate program that this is what he's in charge of to develop this native bee survey and thus the master melatologist program of which Ian Horvath is a, is a student. That's the person who's running for president. So, uh, so he's done just some remarkable work across the state and uh, it's just my pleasure to bring to you Anthony to talk to us today about pesticides and our risk for our bees in an urban setting. So, Anthony, take it away. 
and you'll have to unmute. There you go. Thanks, Cheryl. And thank you so much for that introduction. I always, it seems, it seems this time of year, I, I'm always um, at a pub and I really love uh, speaking to you and I look forward to speaking to you in person soon. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let me know if this works. So here we go. We're going to do that. And do you see, do you see my notes? Yes. Okay. So let's do that. Well, actually it just says you started sharing. Oh, it does. I'm sorry. Now I don't see anything, but give us some time. There is a bit of a lag. Okay. But not seeing anything. What? How's that? Did you check those two little boxes at the bottom when it says start sharing your screen? Uh, let's see. Oh, whoa. Sharing has stopped as the shared windows closed. Okay, well, let's try this one more time. I just want to share this. Okay, should be sharing. It says that you started screen sharing and let's see what happens. And now? Just uh, not yet. Do you have your PowerPoint open on your screen? I do. Okay. So let's try this one more time. There's something um, I'm doing this for two years now. Do, so I don't know. What, oh, wait a sec. There you so go. There we go. Got it. Right. And let's launch it. And what does it look like now? It looks good. Do, is it, um, do you get the full screen or do you have like two? Images? I have the, I have the two with your notes. So if you do your little full screen thingy, there you go. Okay. Full screen looks is good. It, it's not cut off. No. Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks so much for the introduction, Cheryl. I'm so sorry for this. Um, I do really have a story about Cheryl. Um, uh, this time, <laughs> a couple of years ago, we went to Apamundia together. I, I was really delighted to see Cheryl, especially since her poster didn't fit the poster board. Um, and she helped us kind of make a rig it up to fit the board, which was great. And it was all on pesticides. And I'm a little squeamish talking to you guys about pesticides. It's almost like two solitudes. You know, when I'm talking, you know, I spend most of my time talking to pesticide applicators and very little of my time talking to beekeepers. I prefer talking to beekeepers. So I'm gonna try and bridge this today. And I'm gonna even give you some questions that I give pesticide applicators and see how you do. But to begin with, I'm gonna have some poll questions. I always love poll questions. And you don't have to do the poll questions, but if you do have your smartphone close by, you can do them. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to the first question here. And what you see here is a little QR code. If you take your phone, turn on your camera on your phone and line it up with that QR code, you'll be able to, uh, um, uh, you'll hit, a link will pop up. If you touch that link, you'll be able to vote. And what I wanna ask you here it, and how's everybody doing with that out there? I hope well. So you take your phone, you turn on your camera and you hold it up to that square on the screen. And that should pop up a little URL and it will take you into the quiz. And what I wanna ask you is how does your Varroa look this fall? If you didn't check uh, before treating, you just went ahead and treated like that one person, click there. I checked before treating and it was high. I checked before treating, it was low. I didn't check and I didn't treat. Okay, this is working, great. I also, I didn't check before treating myself. I just uh, heard from Carolyn Brees, the neighboring honeybee lab that it was popping up. So I just uh, assumed, use some time all myself. Let's give it a second here for others. Okay, let's say, so I didn't, I didn't check before it was treating, but those of you who did uh, check before treating, it was high. Um, and I see some of you say it was low. Um, you know, I, I certainly um, could see some Varroa popping up. I will show you something though. I think I've shown you this in past years. It's um, like Glenn and how to get rid of um, wax off frames. This is one of my favorite techniques. I have been running styrofoam nuke boxes for now four years. I winter in these boxes. 
Um, and a really great year this year. And the thing I love about these nuke boxes, I uh, make them up. I believe I talked to you once about this. I make them up uh, in July after the blackberry flow is done. After I've got my honey crop, I will take my big colonies down. I'll split them up with about two frames of brood, uh, a frame of honey and some foundation. And I put a queen cell in each of these and they look really great. I was just out um, earlier this week, um, um, oh, last week when we had that nice weather, uh, just to give them another round of feed. And um, they look beautiful. I love these styrofoam nukes and they winter really well. Uh, and um, uh, the nice thing is because they go through a broodless period, I can give them uh, a treatment uh, uh, just after the queen starts laying and I get a really, they never have Varroa problems uh, going into the fall. Love these things. But I, today, actually, I, another thing that I was doing before I get into pesticides, had the great pleasure of going to this trial here. This is my colleague, Marcello Moretti. We've been trying to figure out how to get more pollinator plants into the landscape, particularly in um, hazelnut orchards, young hazelnut orchards. And what you can see here are five different plants. I think on the far right, you can see vetch. In the middle, you can see uh, the, the bright green there is the phacelia. Beside that's California poppy. There's gilia. Uh, uh, gilia, and what's the one on the end? Um, Clarkia. And what you can see here is that these, the, you can see that little patch in the middle that's a herbicide that a lot of uh, hazelnut growers use uh, to kill things back. And you can see um, it really, we're trying to establish wildflowers and we notice that some of the herbicides that they use really make it difficult to grow anything in, the, in those hazelnut orchards. But there are some herbicides uh, where everything seems to be growing quite well. So we're working on this as a way to come up with good strategies uh, to do things like this, this is a hazel, young hazelnut orchard last year that he was working on. We had some great patches of phacelia and also gilia. Um, on the topic of wildflower plants, before I get into my talk today, I have, I think last year I told you we've been working with little mixes that we give to the public. We can make these seed packs available um, um, you know, to anybody doing outreach, including members of PUB. One that I, I, you know, I played with this year that I, this it seemed to have done fairly well through the hot weather is these three plants, Hubim clover, safflower, which is a prickly little um, thistle-like plant and sunflower. This is what it looked like a month after planting. This was uh, just after the heat wave. Uh, we did have to put a little bit of water to get it to germinate, but it seemed to be pretty good after that. And you can see um, this is coming into the end of August. The sunflower has bloomed and you can see below it that sweet clover, that annual sweet clover, the hubam clover coming up um, through it and really getting some great blooms into fall. So this is a nice little combination having the sunflower bloom first and then having the hubam clover come underneath. Hopefully we'll have, um, have those in seed packs soon. The other announcement that I wanted to make uh, just as a program update, finally, this has been launched. We've been for years, uh, my technician, Sarah Kincaid, who many of you know, has been dreaming since the days that she was with ODA of having a, a bee coloring book. Finally found a great partner to do this with the Food Hero program here at OSU. Uh, the, the books are now published. We will be getting these out um, into schools, I believe, um, in the coming year, no, not this fall, but maybe into the next term. Um, they've got a lot, we've carefully gone through, it's got many of the key bees and the, the crops in Oregon that they visit. A nice little, um, little section on managed bees, including beekeeping and the honeys of Oregon. And at the very back has these perforated pages with these trading cards of different bees. So that's coming soon. I, I'm really pleased to announce that. And I hope to get that to you uh, at Pub, especially if you're out doing some um, outreach next year. I did, since Ian, um, you know, is, is a master melatologist, it, do would like to just quickly meant, remind everybody we do have this program at OSU now, the master melatologists, and. In a, one of the podcasts that we do at OSU, we had John Asher from the National University in Singapore who manages the bees of the world. And he says, you know, everybody wants to know what's happening with the bees, but if we really want to know what 
what's going on with the bees, we have to be really specific. We need to know where those bees live, where they are on maps, and how they relate to habitats and ecoregions. And of course, the Master Melatologist Program here at OSU is designed to do that. We have volunteers across the state. They collect bees, actual specimens. We teach them how to do it. This is what it looks like at OSU right now. The Each one of those boxes has about 250 bees. Uh, so we have many thousands of bees that have been collected around the state, and we are in the process of getting them identified. Many of our volunteers do some preliminary identification, but we have to pay for this guy, Lincoln Bester Taxonomist, who goes through all the bees. And to that end, my shameless plug, if you are interested in helping us and supporting um, raising funds, but also having a cool t-shirt, we have a new t-shirt um, program going on where um, here you, we, you can see, go to this website, you can order a shirt of your color and style. There's even hoodies. We've got two designs up there right now. Grumpy, which is um, a ground nesting soil bee, which uh, with a clypeus that looks like a frown, uh, but uh, also the squash bees. So you can find this at the Bonfire website, um, go to the store, Oregon Bee Atlas, uh, and buy a shirt. Okay. That's my shameless plug. Now let me take you to what I usually do and try to relate it to your concerns about pesticides. So every year since I've been here, I've been here five years from November to early March, I'm on the road. Um, at least I used to be before, the, before COVID. And I would go to these pesticide safety education programs uh, that are sponsored uh, by various organizations to train pesticide applicators like these people on how to use pesticides uh, around pollinators. They sit and they, they go here, they, they all have pesticide licenses. To retain that license, they have to go through an education day and it's kind of painful. They have to learn about, you know, gloves and nozzles and all sorts of things. My job is to take them through and understand how to read a pesticide label for bees. And I have been doing this for many years. I have the, I think in Oregon, we have the best program around this. This is the training. They all got to go look at a pesticide label and I make sure they leave the room knowing what it means. And they have those little clickers there. And so I can tell if they're learning what they're learning. And we have about 9,500 licensed pesticide applicators. To date, I've trained about 6,700 of them, more than 6,700 of them. So what I wanna do right now is see how you would do in the pretests that I give all of them. So I ask them a few questions about pesticide labels, see how you do. Okay, the first question is, how can you find out if a pesticide is considered highly toxic to bees? The first option is on the label and then a section of the label called the specific use directions. On the label, but under a section of the label called the environmental hazards, or does bee toxicity not even appear on the label? Actually, there's nothing on a pesticide label that tells you anything about bees. You're actually supposed to take the course so that you know how to, um, how, what, how to use a pesticide around bees. What do you think the answer is? So same thing, hold your phone up the same way you did on that last question to that bar, and let's see how you do relative to the pesticide applicators. And I know their scores because I've done 6,700 of them. I know how they answer this question when they're completely fresh. Let's see if you as beekeepers uh, answer differently. Okay, we got five people answered, maybe just a couple more. Don't be shy, I can't tell who, the, who answers. Um, I, I'm just curious. I'm gonna put you through what I have to put them through every time they see me. Okay, great. Okay, here, I'm gonna hit the button and it's gonna show us how you did. That's great. All pesticide labels will have this information in the environmental hazard section. As you're gonna to hear today, there are some labels that are uh, putting it in specific use directions, but every pesticide label has some information. Okay, so the real answer is B. All labels are gonna have something in the environmental hazards section. And I'm gonna talk about that today. Okay, next skill testing question, folks. By law, by law, are there instances when you can apply a pesticide when honeybees are in the area if the label indicates the product is toxic to bees? Is that 
do you say, yes, there are instances? No, there's no instances. If it says it's toxic to bees and honeybees are in the area, you use no instance where you can apply it by law. I've already told you it's, there's information on the label. I'm asking you some uh, questions about what is on there. Okay. And 50-50, the answer is yes, there are instances. So um, there are some instances and particularly it depends what you're spraying it on. As you're gonna learn today, really bees, the risk of applying something is greatly elevated if it's a situation like this, where you've got meadow foam, uh, that's a very high risk situation. But if you're applying that just to grass, with no blooming plants in it, the risk is quite low. And so the label in that instance uh, will, you'll see how this works. It will allow you to use it in an instance, even if honeybees were in the, in the area. Okay, here's the next skill testing question. I've got, I think one more for you. And this one, applicators always get wrong. Oh, there, okay. If a pesticide label, says you can't apply a pesticide when, and this is the actual language on the label, bees are visiting the treated area. So the pesticide label says you can't apply this pesticide when bees are visiting the treated area. Can you apply this product to a bee attractive plant or crop at night? Situation there with air blast bear in a cherry orchard. Okay, here's the question. If a pesticide label says you cannot apply a pesticide when bees are visiting the treated area, can you apply the product to this plant uh, at night? How many of you say yes? How many of you say no? Thanks for participating in the poll. Okay, the answer is no. The, you'll see that there's a critical one word difference between a product that will break down overnight. Some products remain active right through the next day. And I'm gonna go over how this language is and the applicators rarely get this question right. Um, it's a tricky question and it really kind of hinges on this concept of residual toxicity. I'm gonna to go over this in a minute, but I just wanted to give you a sense of um, what applicators have to deal with when they look at a pesticide label. The language is not altogether clear. Um, so here's the question. Here's what I want to address tonight, four things. But before I go on, were there any questions? Um, I'm going to cover everything I just talked about with the pesticide label. I just wanted to make sure before I moved on, we're not um, any pressing questions. Uh, Ryan did ask, when did I put the cells in those nukes? I put the cells in uh, this year. It, it's uh, well into July. Okay, so this is what I'm gonna to cover today. I want you to leave here tonight. You should be able to know the difference between a pesticide's toxicity and risk to bees. I want you to understand how EPA came about to regulating um, pesticides, how that all works. I want you to be able to pick up a pesticide label at Home Depot, or if somebody comes over to you and asks you a question, I want you to be able to tell, be able to tell them how risky that product is. And then I'm gonna just tell you how we tell applicators at least to reduce uh, uh, exposure of bees to pesticides. So just start with the first one here. God, I'd rather be talking to you about two queen colonies. Okay, so the first thing I will point out and Cheryl mentioned that people are interested in this. If you do suspect that you have a bee kill and I'll talk a little bit about what those symptoms are. Uh, ODA has a website. You just go ODA pesticide and bees in Google and you'll find it. And what that says here is that pesticide applicate, uh, pesticide, ODA has the Sigili lab at OSU trains the ODA inspection staff. There are staff situated all around the state. There's multiple people in the Portland area. Uh, it says here that they work with OSU uh, to figure out um, what's going on, they have to do an investigation. And so if you follow down on that site, it says if you have a, if you have, if you think you've seen a pesticide incidents, dead bees on the front of the colonies, I'll show you this in a minute. What you need to do is call ODA very quickly. 
there, you can either call 211 and they will redirect you um, to the pesticide program at ODA or that direct number right there or the email. And they'll call you back pretty quick and they'll dispatch an investigator and the investigator will come around, look at your colonies, um, try to look around and see if there's any clear in, um, places where bees are dying. Oftentimes when I've done investigations in urban areas or helped with investigations, you know, clearly there's a tree that's been treated or something and there's dead bees underneath. And that's where the investigation starts. They call the company that might have the contract for doing the application and they work backwards that way. So if you have questions, that's how you go about doing it. But it's not what I'm gonna talk about today. I wanna to talk about toxicity and risk. Now, um, risk is um, it really means that there's a high probability that something bad is going to happen, and it's influenced by a host of factors, many of which are beyond the control of the applicators, um, but some are really be within their control. And so I want you to consider what risk means uh, to, from the perspective of bees, um, looking at this a uh, popular urban shade tree, Have you, you've seen them, they're great bee tree, linden. How do you assess the risk of a pesticide application? The first thing is toxicity of the product. Clearly, if you have a pesticide that's highly toxic to bees and it will have the potential to cause a lot more harm to the, to the bees than a product that's not as toxic. But whether a product is toxic or not doesn't tell you much about whether a bee is gonna come into contact with that pesticide. Uh, when this linden tree is not in bloom, if you were to treat it at that point, very few bees are really seen on the tree and the risk is relatively low. Of course, this changes when this linden tree comes into full bloom and it's literally humming with bumblebees and honeybees. You'll often see uh, at this time of year, uh, some of the sweat bees on it. Exposure with a pesticide applied at this time is, uh, is very high and risk is very high. So risk is not just a product of the toxicity of the product. It is the likelihood of exposure to bees. And that's gonna be driven by whether there's bee attractive bloom in the spray zone. Now, that doesn't just mean the thing you're trying to treat. It also means anything else that's in that spray zone, which often means blooming weeds. So take, for example, this peach orchard just outside of Portland. You know, the peaches are completely out of bloom, but there's thousands of bees on that clover. And if you were to air blast spray uh, those peach trees to try and control an aphid, it'd be impossible to prevent drift onto the clover. And so even though, you know, it's, there's no bloom around these peach trees, the, the likelihood of exposure is high. The other thing I just wanna point out when it comes to exposure, when it comes to other bees, there's a lot more than just um, the, whether the plant is in bloom or not. There's whether you're spraying it on something where the bees are gonna be attracted, uh, um, collecting nesting material, or if you spray it directly on their nests. And in the case of honeybees, which do require water when it gets hot, whether there's contamination in the water. And so you can see it here in this cherry orchard, when you spray, this is what we've really started to talk, we've talked about just right now, you, you spray it on the plant, it lands on, you know, either directly on the bee, but it lands on the flowers. That's, that's one kind of problem. But the other problem can occur, for example, if it drifts onto soil, you have a leaf cutting bee here, you've got a mason bee here. If it goes onto the leaf material or the mud that they're collecting, that will, lead to exposure. If you spray directly onto colonies, and this does happen uh, in, and I'll give you some instances a little bit later, um, that can also be a source of exposure. And of course, if you, if it drifts all the way over into some habitat where there's, um, the bees are going to contact wildflowers. The other form of exposure that is a little bit um, different is if it moves its way through the plant. So there are some products, especially in woody, uh, woody ornamentals or trees, where the pesticide can get absorbed and move 
through the plant and be expressed in the nectar and pollen. So even though it wasn't directly sprayed on those flowers, it's sitting in the plant and often in woody plants can be there for a long time and uh, result in exposure through the nectar and pollen. Now, as honeybees, of course, need water for a variety of reasons. They need to cool the hive down. They need to make water for brood food and the young, and they need to re, um, oftentimes reliquify crystallized honey. So we always tell applicators to make sure they're careful when they're making applications where they're standing water, but also when they're cleaning their equipment after an application, because the honeybees can come into contact that way. So to sum up, um, exposure for bees can be impacted in a variety of ways. It's not just direct exposure, which tends to get most of the media coverage. If applicators reduce exposure to bees to a product by considering the time of day, choosing a safer method of application, checking nozzles to see that they're functioning, doing all of these things, they can prevent exposure in these, um, these other ways. <sighs> I, I can just feel how dry this material is to you guys. Do you have any questions about exposure? Um, um, and I'll go on to even something even um, uh, more captivating, um, how pesticide risk is assessed. I do have a question, Anthony. If as an urban beekeeper, yeah. we find that our neighbor has um, become hostile and threatened us and say, put something out intentionally to poison our bees and mm. we find a bee kill Good gracious. and we, um, and we make a report, can uh, homeowners be held liable or responsible for in intentionally, or maybe, you know, maybe they would say it was unintentional, but can homeowners be responsible for these types of um, kills? Yeah, so, okay, There's a, this gets a little tricky. It shouldn't be that tricky. So on each of these pesticide labels, there's a label for use. As far as I know, there, you know, there are products that are used for killing wasps, right? There's those wasp pesticides that are labeled specifically for wasps and hornets. And if like, this is the most obvious example is somebody really, well, here, here's what I would say. Let's say you have a, a neighbor who doesn't like you and doesn't like your bees and has their fruit tree in full bloom and was to spray a pesticide, an insecticide, a highly toxic insecticide on that plant when it's in full bloom, exposing your bees and then killing your bees. That would be a label violation. That is a violation of the label. It would be, uh, it would be um, ODA would um, be able to prosecute, would be able to prosecute on the basis of uh, a label violation, which is federal law. So yes. So if they, and I'll, I'll go into this in a minute, but that's one way in which if somebody did something like that and you could establish it and it was really um, clear cut case, you know, the person even admits it or something, then that would be a label violation and would be a violation of federal law. Thank you. Okay. If somebody sprayed raid on the front of your colony, I imagine that would also be, that's not what, it's a different kind of violation. It's not listed for killing honeybee colonies. And then of course you could, you know, um, prosecute them outside of the pesticide label where they actually were trying to harm your bees. Good, good to know. Thank you. I hope nobody has that situation, yikes. Uh, my neighbor did threaten and I told her she did, she'd really be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> well, let, let me explain how, okay, this is, let me get into this uh, section now, risk, ass uh, risk assessment as an evolving field and why it's against the law. So risk assessment is both a product of toxicology and law, but also politics. And if you look in the United States, pesticide regulation started in the strangest place. I have Upton Sinclair's The Jungle here. As um, many of you know, uh, The Jungle is sort of uh, recounts the terrible working conditions and health violations uh, that occur in the meatpacking sector in, um, in Chicago. Um, this was the progressive era, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and so um, the Pure Food and Drug Act, which is what pesticides first became regulated under, really didn't have much to do with pesticides other than, you know, when you buy something, there's a seal of purity that just in, 
made sure that you couldn't adulterate something or fraudulently label them. Um, you know, if something, um, it, it made sure that some of these unsanitary practices were regulated. And to that extent, um, that led to the Insecticide Act of 1910, which really wasn't about pesticide safety, but it was saying you couldn't sell something as a pesticide that didn't have the right ingredient in it. It had to be, it had to list, had set purity standards, and it was meant to sort of protect farmers from dangerous or ineffective pesticides. It said, if you're going to buy this bottle of Pyrox, it's going to have this stuff in it. This changed in 1938. Um, this, uh, there was a, a change that said, started to protect the public. Tolerances were established for pesticides and food, uh, processed food. And there was this thing called the Delaney Amendment, which set a zero tolerance for carcinogens being added to food. After World War II, there was yet another piece of legislation. And this is um, really the modern era of uh, insecticide regulation, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Redundicide Act of 1947. And in here, this is where you get something like a pesticide label. And so there's warning labels, protect the user, the public, and non-target species. Uh, and um, you start to see something looking like modern pesticide regulation. Now, this all started to change because of an environmental concern. In the 1960s, there was an amendment to FIFRA um, that uh, allowed um, the Secretary of Agriculture to refuse a registration for a pesticide. So now there were standards for pesticide registrations. And this FIFRA amendment um, was first used on DDT. So Rachel Carson's Silent Spring made the case that DDT bioaccumulated. You had this situation, for example, in um, um, raptor eggs where the eggshells were getting thinner and thinner and this uh, using that power in the amended FIFRA, DDT was revoked by the Secretary of Agriculture. Just a, a couple years later, big changes with the environmental movement in 1972 brought about uh, EPA, which took the hand of uh, took the pesticide licensing out of USDA's hand and put it in a new agency's hand, the Environmental Protection Agency. And under the Environmental Protection Agency, there was this big emphasis on environmental effects, which is where bees started to come into the picture. And it also said that all pesticides would be reviewed every nine years to see if anything had changed, if there was new data that had been uh, generated, for example, with DDT. As DDT was used, it was clear something was going on. They wanted to make sure that there was a constant reassessment of every pesticide. I'm almost done folks with this, but I will say this is what led to the situation where me, where I am going into room training pesticide applicators. In a particularly great episode of our, our podcast, Pollination, episode 186, I had the opportunity to talk to Dean Hertzfeld, who's a, a real guru who knows how the sausage is made in pesticide regulation. And he pointed out at this junction when EPA started to look at these pesticides more carefully and then put, impose stricter health, safety, and environmental standards, it became clear that most of these pesticides could not be uh, purchased by the public. They were too unsafe. And so Congress uh, created a new class of pesticide called restricted use pesticides that you could only get if the state certified you to use them. That's why you can go to Home Depot and buy a pesticide but there's certain pesticides you can't buy without a license. This all happened with the um, with EPA coming into being in 1972. The other thing that happened in the 70s is this: we started to see our first real big pesticide kills of bees. Um, the one that really uh, was the horror story of the 70s was a product called PenCap M. It was a, a toxic pesticide, but it was formulated in a small little bead that was turned out to be the same diameter as pollen. And so it was meant to, put, they put it in a small little bead so it would be slowly released so they wouldn't get, you would get longer release. But what ended up happening, the bees brought it back and you'd get these huge bee kills on the Great Plains. 
And this kind of triggered the language on the pesticide labels that you saw on the questions that I gave you. Uh, coming out of the coming into the early 80s, there was the pollinating insect hazard statement started to appear. And you can see that um, all pesticide labels have to have this. And so if you pick up any pesticide label and look at the environmental hazard section, because of those pesticide poisoning in the 70s, they all say this product is highly toxic to bees or toxic to bees or won't mention bees because it doesn't meet the threshold of being toxic. So every pesticide label will have this. Now, hazard is one thing, it's the potential to cause harm. But as I talked earlier about exposure and risk, risk is a different thing. It's the chance of actually causing harm. And so the, the risk really started to come into pesticide regulation in the 90s. And it happened because of two National Research Council um, assessments of early, earlier legislation. I don't want to get into it, but the gist of it was that it wasn't enough to say if something, if you remember, there was this clause that went through said anything that causes cancer sh can't be used. But clearly there was a way in which it, um, it, it became clear that as you process food, the pesticides start to get accumulate, they get at higher concentrations. And this became a barrier to any new pesticides getting registered because, you know, food processing, you know, you make fruit leather and you start to really accumulate pesticides. And so this led to a crisis in food in pesticide regulation. And it led to a, a new model where when you register a pesticide after the 90s, they looked at the whole food consumption pattern of the most vulnerable demographic being infants. They looked at the pesticide residues in those food in the population. They figured out what the actual dietary exposure was, and then they would set thresholds uh, on how many pesticides could be uh, registered in that class. So there it is, and all these studies. So this led in the 1990s to this new, God, I'm, I, I'm, don't fall asleep, guys, I'm almost there. In the 1990s, they came up with a new a whole setup. This is the last big overhaul before the pollinator crises that we had in the last couple of years of um, the food Quality Protection Act, where they said, they said essentially, there's uh, there's cumulative risks in the. We look at what everybody eats, the cumulative aggregate exposure of eating apples, and all the different pesticides you're going to get with those in eating that apple. We need to take into account all of that risk. In addition, we need to take into all the risk of all the ways you're going to be exposed to the pesticide in an average, um, in an average life and an average diet. Uh, for the most vulnerable person. And if, if it turns out that the exposure starts to overfill this cup, then they won't register any more pesticides in that class. That's where pesticide regulation was before this. Oregon was really at the forefront of driving a shift from hazard to risk for bees. Because when this happened in Wilsonville, EPA was in a crisis. They didn't know how to deal with this. And so we saw a shift from hazard to risk assessment for bees. So beginning at about 2012, the whole way in which pesticides were assessed for bees changed fundamentally. So now in the old days, what they would do is they would look at a pesticide and see how toxic it was. And they would just make a blanket statement about you know, a hazard. Now they do risk. So when any new product is assessed, the exposure potential of bees is first assessed and it's assessed through various models of, you know, the attractiveness of different plants where the, the pesticide is gonna be used as applied to. Then they do very detailed studies, both in the lab, but also at a semi-field level. And then they'll go back to that crop and, it, and actually treat it and look at the pesticide that's expressed in the nectar and pollen. It's a much more robust system and it's very new. Any questions on that before I then launch you into reading a pesticide label? How are we doing here, Cheryl? Can you get the read of the room? I can't even see you guys. So like, I'm just, I'm. I think you're doing great. And I personally find this fascinating. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Any, any questions from from that? That was a lot. It was dense. It yeah, we're getting. Uh, you know, our people are liking it. They're engaged. So Jess okay. thinks it's great, and uh, yeah, we're happy. 
Okay, happy people. Thank you. I, uh, I, I do think this is important because there, I think the key thing to get across is that things have changed a lot. And I'm going to show you right now in this next section by taking you through some actual pesticide labels to show you how things have changed. So for a long time, since the 70s, we've been dealing with pesticide labels that deal only with hazard. And I told you this is captured in something called the pollinating insect hazard statement, which is on every pesticide label in the uh, environmental hazards. And it's specified in the pesticide label review manual, which are read as um, Cheryl knows, I've had a student go through all the pesticides that are used in Oregon, sort of assessing that for you know um, adherence to the policy. And um, the first thing that you see on any pesticide label is a statement of acute toxicity. Acute toxicity looks like this. It's dead bees out front of the colony. And I do not know why when you apply a acutely toxic pesticide to a clover crop, the bees just die out front. Either I think what happens is the bees fly into the colony, they die in there and the nest mates throw them out, but you often see the bees in the front of a pesticide poisoning twitching. And I think maybe what happens is the bees try to find their way back and they just can't make it. At any rate, if when a colony has uh, come into contact with an acutely toxic insecticide, you often will see this symptom, dead bees out front of the colony uh, and very rapidly it will happen within a, and it will happen over a matter of days too. So it'll happen, you'll see a lot of dead bees. This is a really severe poisoning. The one I showed you previously is more what you will experience. And they'll still accumulate typically over the next day or so. Now, acute toxicity, as I mentioned, is captured on all pesticide labels under the environmental ha hazard section. Well, what you need to, what I tell applicators to do is scan the section of the label for the following phrases. You look for the phrases highly toxic to bees or toxic to bees. And here you can see on this TriStar label, it indicates acute toxicity in the second sentence. So there it is. It says this product is toxic to wildlife. This product is toxic to bees. The phrase that you see on that label corresponds to a lab test that everybody who's registering a pesticide needs to complete prior to registering that product. If it takes very little of the product to kill 50% of the test bees in this lab test, it triggers the language highly toxic to bees. If it takes more of the product to kill the test bees, the label indicate toxic to bees. And finally, if the amount required to kill the bees is relatively high, you really have to bring the dose up before you see uh, death, there's going to be no mention of bee toxicity on the pesticide label. And so I always ask the applicators at this point, after we did the test question at the beginning and they all got the answers wrong, and I gave them a little bit of information, I say, which product could you apply to a bee attractive plant during bloom during the day when bees are active? And I show them these three pesticide labels. So Mustang Max has the environmental hazard section. That's the language that they see on the label. Altacor has this language on the label. And Arena has this language on the label. Why don't you take a look at those three labels after what I just told you? And I want you to tell me which product could you apply to be attractive plant during bloom, during the day when bees are active on that plant? Okay, here's the test. Okay, we got one answer. Well, oh, there you go, okay. When this pandemic's over, I'm gonna come over there and hug each and every one of you for answering these questions. <laughs> okay, so Altacore, that's right. Cause if you look at the Altacore label, it doesn't mention bees. And if it doesn't mention bees in the environmental hazard section, you assume that the uh, registrant has applied it and there is no acute toxic effects. Now, there's another form of toxicity. Acute toxicity is sort of one exposure and you, you know, the bees touch it and there's an effect. Chronic toxicity is another issue. 
it's a lot of nicks and cuts, repeated lingering effects that maybe don't kill the bee outright, but have these effects like impaired foraging, increased disease susceptibility. And the way I describe this to pesticide applicators is in the following way. I tell them a honeybee colony is a complicated thing. And I tell them just, um, just like a hive, uh, if you think of it like a mammal, there's um, a bunch of different organs that are working and the hive responds to um, the environment as a collection, you know, it, 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 it's got a kind of regulatory thing going on. And, but if they're overwhelmed, the hive, maybe the hive always has a little bit of an infection going. And if they're confronted with poor nutrition, pesticides and all of these things, but it's not acute pesticide toxicity is kind of chronic, what ends up happening is that the colony maybe loses some of its field bees um, and some of the sick bees leave. But then you start to have a smaller colony and that smaller colony starts to have a hard time keeping its processes running. It's, it has a chilling loop that develops. The colony seems, you know, it's moved and reduced down a box. I tell the applicators, oh, the boxes may look smaller. And I say, you know, then the bee mortality accelerates because the colony is kind of weak. It's having a hard time regulating. And then they come back and you find that there's a dead colony. So I tell applicators that even if there's not acute toxicity that takes place, using pesticides at any time can sometimes have these chronic effects that aren't really captured on many of the pesticide labels and that the beekeeper may not even notice the problem until months after the application is put on. So I let grower uh, applicators know that and let them know that chronic toxicity is not considered for most labels. So you see no warning on them. And so I tell them, uh, you can't really know if a pesticide is safe to bees. And I tell them there's a number of reasons. One, this new risk assessment may take quite a few years to get through all the backlog of pesticide labels. And so they're going to be dealing with pesticide labels that haven't undergone the full uh, suite of new tests, that the risk assessment simplifies a pretty complex high process, and there are many assumptions, so you can never be fully sure that the risk assessment, even though they put conservative estimates in the risk assessment. And the final thing I say is the risk assessment looks at each product singly, and what you'll see later is that with many pesticides, they seem to compound and um, interact with one another. So I tell all pesticide applicators, regardless of whether the product says it's toxic to bees or not toxic to bees, I tell them to be very, very careful using anything when there's full bloom out. I tell them you should try to get your pesticide treatments on before something comes into bloom or after petal drop. Now, this pesticide insect hazard statement has another element to it that confuses everybody. It's this issue of residual toxicity. And to give you a sense of this, I do a lot of these tests, as Cheryl mentioned, uh, with different crops. Here you can see, I've got a, a bunch of products here where I've sprayed plots and then harvested, this is radish uh, leaves three hours later. And you can see the product on the left that we talked about earlier, the bifenthrin, which is in Brigade. You know, at three hours later, if bees are on that, um, leaf material, they'll die. Whereas this other product, it's also Xrel, is very toxic to bees. If you apply it to that leaf three hours later and put bees all over it, there's no difference from an untreated control. And time has an effect. This is three hours after the spray, but if I go back and harvest the leaf 24 hours later, you can see even with the bifenthrin, it starts to wear off. It's not as toxic. There's still dead bees in there, but you know, a lot less than at three hours. So that, uh, that estimate of how long it takes for a pesticide to break down so it's not toxic to bees is actually captured on the label under environmental hazards. You look at the label and what you do is you look for this language of actively visiting or visiting. So here you can see it on the label. It says, do not apply this product while bees or other pollinating insects are actively visiting the treated area. Now, unfortunately, it's a one word difference between a product that it, um, if you apply it in the evening, it will break down the following day and a product that won't. Now, not all labels use this ambiguous language and I'll go over this ambiguous language in more detail in a sec. Some labels like these Corteva products are very clear. All of these products will say on it, 
This product is toxic to bees exposed to treatment during the three hours following treatment. These products, if you apply them at dusk when the bees are back in the hives by the following, and they're very toxic to bees, but the following day, they'll have dissipated sufficiently that they're not toxic anymore. The bees can walk all over the leaf material and not have any effect. But not, this is not what you see on most labels. Unfortunately, they've got this strange language that if a product dissipates, uh, um, you have to interpret these language, this, this language on the label. So if a product dissipates over the course of eight hours, in other words, the time between a treatment at dusk when the bees be, uh, until when the bees become active again, the label uh, will indicate do not apply this product when bees are actively visiting the treated area. The key word is actively. But if the product remains toxic into the next day, the word actively disappears. It's so stupid. Whoever came up with this really was a bean counter and didn't understand language. So if it's missing just the word actively, it means this product will remain hot the next day, will kill bees. So if you apply, if an applicator gets this wrong, it's the difference between a product that will be toxic the next day versus a product that will break down overnight. How well do you guys do? So here's Mustang Max is what I asked them. Okay, I said, you had taught you this. Here's the second part of this label. It says, do not apply this product or allow it to drift to blooming crops if bees are visiting the treated area. Can this product be applied safely at night? Look at, the, look at what it says there. I'm gonna put the poll question up. And by this time, the applicators are so worried. They wondered why they sat in on this class. Um, I will say though, they typically get it right. They typically figure this out and they, they didn't know this before they took the class. So Mustang Max can be applied to be attractive plant in bloom at night. Is that true or false? Oh yeah, I, there's two people up for the challenge. Excellent. Good job, you guys. I'm so proud of the Portland Urban Beekeepers, but I'm always proud of the Portland Urban Beekeepers, so that's no, uh, no surprise. Okay, here we go. Very good, it's false. Why is it false? It's false because it's missing the word actively. It remains toxic. So if it said these do not apply to, uh, do not allow it to drift to blooming crops, if bees are actively visiting the treated area, it would mean it would break down, but it's missing that word. So if it says actively, you can assume you can't use it whenever anything's in bloom and during the day. So if you see actively, you can't use it in this circumstance and you can't use it in this circumstance. But if the word actively is there, it will break down overnight so you can do this. As soon as the word actively is gone, that means you can't use this product. It lasts longer than eight hours. And so not only can you not use it in full bloom in daylight, but you can't use it even at night. You have to wait till the, the, all the petals drop off that plant before you can treat it. So can you do this? The word actively is not there? No. Okay. So I want to just review what we've learned here. So we're almost done. How are we doing? Yes. Okay. So we've, I told you early on in this, when those early pesticide kills happened, pesticide labels adopted this hazard language. And you can see it on the label. If you pick up any pesticide label, you peel it open, you look at it, in the environmental hazard section, you parse it, you look for the words highly toxic to bees or toxic to bees. And I tell applicators, as soon as you see that, you should not spray uh, during bloom, wait till petal fall. I say, but if you're in a real crunch, if you have no options and you're gonna lose the crop, then you need to go through the label and look for the rest of that language for the residual toxicity statement. And if it says, if you see the word foraging or visiting without the word actively, you can't use it, I'm so sorry. But if it has the word actively or foraging, then you have a product that you, you could use in an emergency. Now, I just wanna point out that's the old system. I did tell you at the beginning that be, uh, starting with the Bee Kill in Wilsonville, things started to change. We started to have, first off, right after Wilsonville and because of Wilsonville, EPA for has never done this before, 
they changed all the pesticide labels and they came up with a new thing on pesticide labels called the B diamond. The B diamond provides more information, uh, but is kind of in a limbo between hazard and risk assessment. And it is gone the way of the dodo. It was kind of a transitional thing. So these bees with a diamond, you'll see, maybe you've seen them on pesticide labels, you're gonna stop seeing them. They're kind of going out of, they're retiring them. And so on them, you would see things like this. If you have crops, if you have crops under contracted pollination, it says, wait till all the petals have dropped, unless you're in a situation where you give the beekeeper 48 hours notice. They were kind of terrible messages. And they've really kind of given way to this now where um, they, the pesticide itself has gone through an actual risk assessment. We, in Oregon, we maybe have 30, 40 labels that have gone through the full risk assessment. And now you see something in directions of use. And the one thing I will say about this coming to Cheryl's question, in some states, the hazard statements are not as enforceable. Uh, they're treated as advisory. They're treated as advice. In Oregon, they're treated as actual law, but federally, the hazard statement was not that enforceable. Now that the um, instructions are moving to directions for use, they are absolutely enforceable. And this is something that if you violate it, um, there's no ambiguity, you will be prosecuted. So now we're seeing things like at the transform label where an environmental hazard statements, it has all that language you are used to, but it says, you got to go to the label directions to get the real stuff. And here you can see it says, you know, for citrus, you have to notify all the beekeepers within a mile. You have to limit your application times to two hours prior to sunset. And it gives you very clear language. So we're going to see a lot better labels come out. And pesticide applicators are going to be given very clear instructions. And there's going to be very tough consequences if they don't follow that information. Any questions about that before I give you, um, I want to give you two quick curveballs um, to uh, that I give the pesticide applicators. And Denise, this might be, I don't think it's off topic, but what are like the top three um, insects that we're trying to kill on Oregon crops? Uh, great. It depends what we're talking about. So I would say on most of like the uh, clovers, the, the seed crops, we have many excellent seed crops that are very attractive to bees. We're talking about aphids and sucking insects. So aphids on clover, ligus bug, any of the sucking insects are really hard to kill. And they always, they always, it's that transition from flower to seed pod that they're kind of doing their damage. So they're forced to treat around bloom. Okay. So that's in those crops. When it comes to most of our blooming fruit, um, there's, the biggest risk is blossom rots. And so in blueberries, for example, beekeepers have difficult time in blueberry and there's very heavy fungicide use. Fungicides, as I'm about to mention, have no warnings on the labels because they're not acutely toxic. And they seem to only be toxic when mixed in conjunction with other pesticides. And so that's a trickier thing. And the same thing goes for cherries, any of the fruit crops, there's just, um, there's rots that happen on the blossoms that the growers are applying a lot of fungicide to control. Okay, and we have a couple of questions. Um, one, uh, Jana wants to know, how do you notify a farmer that you are a beekeeper? And then um, someone else asked, what would a beekeeper do with one hour's notice? Yeah, I know. Some of these notifications are, uh, the, the notifications are like 48 hours typically. And so um, that's what a lot of the labels are. But 48 hours, if you are based in Salem and you've got bees in the dowels and you have to move a forklift out there and get, it's just, it's not enough time. And so we always tell the growers, you need to give them a lot more time and be in constant communication with them. And so moving, it depends on what the product they're using is. So the first question to have with the applicators, what are you planning to spray? And then you go through the label and it's like, this is a highly toxic product with a long residual time. I got to get my bees out of there. Like I'm just not, I can't keep my bees in this spot because they're just going to get hammered. Or they say it's going to be a, a herbicide on the ground. And it's not going to be on the plants. And you're like, okay, I'm going to keep my bees here. So you have that conversation with the growers. The, but the first question again, Cheryl. Um, 
how would you as a beekeeper notify a farmer that you are notify a, a farmer that you are a beekeeper? It's like, I would just give my own example. I live off the Rocky Butte and we have um, these farms that are maybe um, two miles away and say he decided to spray. How would he know about all of the backyard beekeepers? I mean, I just don't think he would. No, they, they won't. And I think the thing to do in that situation is in the off season, like now, uh, go to the farmer and to say, Hey, we've got bees in the area. We're here. Here's our telephone numbers. You know, when you're spraying, give us a call and just give us a heads up. And if you could give us two days notice, that would be very helpful. Most growers, when you approach them in that way that we, they see me every time. And I tell them, you're going to see what I tell them in a minute. I say, get that communication going early. Uh, that's what I would do when it happens they're it's you know they're dealing with a pest problem they got the spray boom out and you then it becomes like this they're just stressed and it doesn't work very well but i think reaching out to the growers and you know they're in the area and you know they've got pest problems now is the way to do it and give them a list of numbers say text us you know here's the text chain or designate one person who will you know let everybody else know that i think that would be the most effective way to do it Okay, and then we have one final question uh, from Jess, who asks, are there also potential toxicity issues involving fertilizers, such as weed and feed uh, for lawns, uh, thinking about backyard beekeepers who keep their hives right on their lawns? Well, I will say with herbicides, you know, there has been, there's a lot of, you know, human health um, research on things like glyphosate, a common, very common herbicide. So there's, and you know, there's, there are, there are human health hazards with, you know, there are some pretty nasty herbicides out there. Um, but when it comes to uh, bees, it's really the loss of forage. And so there's, um, weed and feeds are using, have herbicides in them. So the toxicity to the bees is very low. I think with some of those lawn care products, there can be insecticides you don't really need insecticides in Oregon lawns. We don't have the kind of pest problems that you have out east or, you know, grubs that will go underneath and chew the roots off. And so nobody should be using an insecticide in, in Oregon lawns. And that's where you would worry if you put an insecticide in, then you had a clover bloom or dandelion bloom. That's where you'd have it. But the weed and feeds that be are sold here will have a, a will be there just to control the dandelions, which is another problem is, Glenn pointed out they're great plants, but it won't have toxic effects on the bees. Okay, let me take you to two curveballs. Um, the two curveballs are systemic insecticides and fungicides and tank mixes. So systemic insecticides, of course, are this emerging problem that the old regulatory system did not really take into account, where they're looking at how many hours after you spray a pesticide on a leaf, is it still toxic? Well, this is a totally different situation. And this is where ODA really had to scramble when we had the series of pesticide incidences on Linden. So the first one, of course, that happened in Wilsonville seemed like just a typical old pesticide applicator not reading the label problem because they applied it very close to bloom while the plant was in bloom. It just seemed like what what they shouldn't be doing. But then there was an incident in Hillsboro where a trunk, you know, Linden blooms in June. They applied the pesticide to the trunk, not to the leaves or the flowers in March, and they had dead bees underneath it. And then there was a series in 2013, there were um, two more incidences in Portland with a different product where they didn't apply it to the trunk, but the soil. And again, well before bloom in March and May, and then, you know, ODA was in damage control trying to figure out what's going on. And they, they actually pulled the labels. They said, you can't use these products anymore. But somebody in Eugene had old product and didn't, it didn't the label hadn't been amended. And they had a, a series of incidents. And again, one in May with a trunk application. So it was clear that how these bees were getting exposed was in a completely different way. And the regulatory system really didn't have a way to account for it. And what was happening, of course, as I mentioned earlier, it was not this old system of spraying on the leaves and flowers, but it was moving its way through the trunk and uh, into the flowers. And ODA did a great job. They, they pulled all the registration from that whole class of products, 
on linden tree. We haven't seen these problems since. Last curveball are fungicides and insecticides mixed together at the same time. And Ellen Topenshofer, who you all love and know, collected these videos when she was in California. And beekeepers there just saw this weird thing. The bees would go all the way to development and then they would die. They kind of went and they just, nobody quite could figure out what was going on until um, Ohio State University had pieced it all together. What they did is they reared larvae uh, with these different products. The ones in black are fungicides. The ones in blue are insecticides. And you should recognize this insecticide because it was an example that we used earlier, Altacore. You can feed Altacore to a larva and has no effect on their development. You can feed these fungicides to a larva and there's no development. But what they found out was if you took Altacore and you mixed it with the fungicide tilt, you would get those symptoms. Mixed together, two things that on their own are not toxic become highly toxic. So this is a, a big area of research. And I know uh, you've probably had Dr. Chakrabarti, who's now in uh, Mississippi, who has been working on this with fungicides, but it's a whole new area. So risk assessment is gonna have to evolve to take into account these newer problems. And it's constantly been evolving. Let me just quickly end with for what I tell applicators to do. I tell them whenever possible, you have beekeepers in the area, try to do your pest control before anything is in bloom. If you can control the pest and keep it down so that you don't have to put an application during bloom, that's best. The other point is after bloom, but of course, after bloom, you've got situations happening when things are starting to bloom, you start to have dandelions. So you're gonna really have to make sure before your treatments go down, you're gonna have to mow down those flowering weeds. You have to be very mindful of any drift. So I tell them, you know, let's say you're in this situation. You're this person over here. You've got an early variety of cherry, the petals have fallen. This person still has bees there and there's wild habitat here. What do you do? I say the first thing you need to do is talk to your beekeeper early and often and do it before the season starts. And I show all the applicators this episode 83 from uh, with Harry Vanderpool, where Harry points out that he's making a living too, but he understands they're making a living. And if you sort of um, uh, go forward with that recognition and that mutual respect, you can get things done. So, you know, Harry might show up with his, you know, expensive equipment and move those colonies, but it's going to cost him and he's going to lose some sleep and he's very busy. So making sure the growers know that is, there's a give and take in this situation. You can't just expect the beekeepers to accommodate you every time. Second thing I point out is watch where you're working. You know, I work a lot in cherry orchards and, you know, here's an example. You can see there's the cherries and here's a balsam root. Uh, uh, loop and plant community right next to it with an air blast sprayer. If you just go down this row with the air blast sprayer going full hilt, you're going to hit all of these plants. And so I tell them they got to keep a buffer or shut their nozzles off uh, to prevent drift onto that. Next thing I point out is they got to keep a buffer around the colonies. And I have been working with my colleague um, in, in Mount Vernon, this situation in blueberries, Half the blueberry growers want the beekeepers to put their colonies right up against the blueberry plants. Whereas some like this person out in, um, in Sio's got a nice, you know, 30, 40 foot buffer from the plants. Clearly this one on the right, there's no way they can treat that last bush and not spray and drench the entire colony in fungicide. So we tell them, let the beekeeper set their colonies back. Let them get out of the spray zone. Don't spray those colonies. Last thing we point out is that, you know, if you're going to put a spray in here and you've got a lot of blooming clover you get, and you're going to be something toxic, you need to take it down. Anyways, that's what I tell, uh, I tell growers. I ask them lots of questions. I've been accumulating all sorts of data on it. And I, I think we've done a good job. I think our applicators are getting the message. Um, and that's a big part of why I'm here in Oregon. So uh, as much as I would just love to just talk to you about beekeeping, <laughs> somebody's got to do this job. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I think you did a great job and I do appreciate all your work that you're doing. And I'll just open it up uh, for questions. You can either press your space bar and talk to Andy, Andy or you can uh, type in your question.
You know, I guess, you know, it goes, it always goes a bunch of ways because we actually have pesticide labels. Like when we pick up any of our products, we actually have a label with them. And I don't know if we treat, treat our labels as seriously as the beekeepers do. So anytime you pick up, uh, you know, a package of Apovar, Apovar there's, or, you know, um, um, quick strips or anything, there's going to actually be a, you have an environmental hazard section. You have all those sections of the label on there. And I know there's been, you know, the reason why you don't need a license is because you're applying it to your own colonies. So anyways, it's something to keep in mind that applicators are really trying to understand these labels and spend a lot of time on them. But um, we also have pesticide labels and it bears reading the label fully before you apply a, an acaricide to your colonies. So uh, Micah asks you, Anthony, what's your favorite pesticide to use at home? <laughs> I love those little borax, you know, those little pharaoh ants that get in your house, those little borax um, plastic things where they just go in. It's just so effective. I use that all the time. I, I, I always get a few pharaoh ants. And I, I know the first line, Integrated pest management means not relying on a pesticide. I do try to sweep my floor, but I'm so busy training pesticide applicators that there often are many crumbs on my kitchen floor that attract the farrow ants. So um, you shouldn't be using the pesticide to begin with, but yeah, I like those. Are there many hazards or bee kills reported in urban and suburban areas with backyard beekeepers? You know, we have, um, ODA will get you the figures and they're not a lot of them. I will say there's not a lot of pesticide kills that are verified by ODA with bees. And, you know, I had one situation, I've, I've had a couple of these where it's quite clear that the colonies have been killed by a pesticide. And there's, a, there's many where people, you know, it's very important to join the bee club to be, uh, be able to diagnose what's wrong with your colony. And I know Dewey's on the call and he may want to talk about, there's a new, he's worked on an initiative to help beekeepers diagnose why bees die uh, with, um, with NAPSI. Um, but um, most of the situations I've seen have been a, a colony that has other problems. But there is the situation where I've seen bees that have been clearly damaged by pesticide, but ODA can't nail down where it came from. That happens a lot, unfortunately. It's sometimes hard uh, to pin down where the source of the pesticide kill came from. Do you so, think that some yeah. of the things that we use as miticides for the Varroa um, have the, the, um, the synergistic toxicity with some of the things that are used in the environment? There was some work on this. Reed did some work, Reed Johnson at Ohio State. Dewey might know more on this. He may also be um, washing his dishes. <laughs> <laughs> I love Zoom. Oh, no, there he is, now, I saw him flicker. <laughs> yeah. Uh, boy, there isn't much, uh, you're right. Um, okay. There, there is some suggestion that, again, this whole issue with fungicides being affected by, um, by previous exposure or um, in a tank mix or you know, one after another. The, the jury's out. We really haven't done much work on that one yet. You know, and I guess, you know, just a, a, a connection to that, I, I think, I hope I gave you, I've given you guys this, um, you've got a mustache, Dewey. I haven't seen you forever. Oh, darn. Okay. <laughs> but there's this whole uh, area of, um, I, I have this talk that I give on comb replacement. I don't know if I've ever given it to you guys, but there has been um, good work showing that if you just retain your comb for a long time, you do start to get, you know, buildup of not only the acaricides, but you also get a buildup of the stuff that your bees are just picking up on their bodies. The lipophilic stuff starts to accumulate in the wax. And so one thing I would say is, you know, we have to use acaricides and some of them do accumulate in the colony and sort of reside there and may have a synergistic effect. And it really isn't a case for doing what Glenn suggested and getting those crazy monster things in your compost to eat your comb. 
So replacing your comb re frequently, I think, is a good, is an excellent strategy. Frequently defined as every other year, every three years. What do you think? I I always, I usually retire. I usually, when I start my nukes, I put two big frames of foundation in. So I'm doing, you know, that's almost half of my comb a year. I don't think you need to be that. I I know people who do like three combs, three combs of super a year. Okay. In the brew chamber. Yeah. So we have a, another question. What are your thoughts about the neonicotoids? <laughs> Do they accumulate and cause sublethal effects? They do. Uh, so the one thing I would say, so neonicotinoids are this class of insecticides. And remember I told you in the 1990s, there was concern about aggregate pesticide exposure and human health hazards. The neonicotinoids were the answer. So the older class of pesticides, the organophosphates, um, the carbamates, had high human toxicity. So what the pesticide companies developed was a class of pesticides had relatively low human toxicity. Turns out, unfortunately, they have other environmental effects. The problem is that the class is not all the same. So there's some products, sorry, this is a PDX form catcher. This is coming around in, in a couple of ways, but I think it's important to point out because people will take the class of compounds as one thing. So there's two groups, the cyano group and the nitro group in the neonicotinoids. The cyano group actually is, you know, it's about as problematic as some of the pyrethroids uh, commonly used, you know, insecticide. And it's, you know, it's, uh, um, but it is a neonicotinoid, but it's of a different kind of character. And they get clumped together, which is unfortunate because I often, you know, see them as a good alternative to other things out in the landscape. The other ones, the nitro groups, are the ones that EPA has, you know, in the EU, they've, you know, uh, banned. In Canada, they've restricted their uses. And in the US, they've put caveats on their use. So in the US, they're not going completely away, but there, there are some um, restrictions that are going to be coming in on them. And what I think has been noticed is the, the real problematic areas have been the sublethal effects is because the stuff goes into the nectar and pollen and accumulates in the colony. And the places that it's been the worst have been the situation around um, where you have it drifting on during um, the application of treated seed. It gets, it, the seed goes in the ground and especially on bigger seed like corn, it doesn't adhere to the seed very well and it flakes off and it dusts over the landscape. So this is not a situation that we really face in Oregon. We don't have a lot of corn production, so it's not as big an issue here. In Oregon, the issue for us was the woody ornamentals. So in the problem, I just as a, as a, I used to work, I remember when neonicotinoids first came out, I was, a, I was just out of graduate school. I was in Vancouver and I was doing street tree management. And we used to have the situation where you would have tilia aphid. It would build up on the linden trees. And the only thing we could do was clear the street and go down a street with a boom sprayer and put insecticidal soap on. And it was so totally disruptive and neighbors hated us. And I saw this thing in a magazine that said, oh, all you need to do is make a little hole in the trunk and put some of this stuff in and it'll control the aphids and you don't have to clear the street. And it's just like, it just goes straight into the tree. I thought it was the best thing ever. But what turns out is that stuff is very, it sits in um, woody plants very long. And so we saw the situation in, with the linden aphid here, you can apply it months before the plant comes into bloom and it sits, it sits in the bark, it sits in the tree and it moves up. And so um, it accumulates there and it sort of like bleeds into the flower. So I think that's one of the things that EPA is going to be restricting is those woody ornamentals that are bee attractive. So those are my thoughts on neonicotinoids. They are, they do have sublethal effects as many insecticides do, especially when the dose gets very low. When it's very high, it kills bees. It's really effective at killing bees. And it does accumulate, especially in woody ornamentals and sort of bleeds out into the nectar and pollen over a long period of time. And EPA has um, 
looked very carefully at these and they've restricted a number of their uses. So they're not going to be as widespread. But now we're seeing a whole, you know, I, I think the lesson that I've learned is the pesticide industry uh, responds to regulation. And in some, we're seeing a whole class of new chemicals that are very different. And, you know, the verdict is still out how those are going to respond. I could go on about this. I've got lots of thoughts on this. I've heard growers talk about what they think about these new products, and I'm not sure it's going to solve the problem. It's going to change the problem, I think. I'd be glad to talk about it. Great. <laughs> well, Anthony, thank you so much for uh, talking to us tonight. And um, I don't see any other questions. So unless anybody has a burning question, then we'll say good night. Good luck out there. And I hope to see you all at the State Beekeepers Association. And one thing uh, Cheryl did mention is it's hybrid this year. So you can participate virtually as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. Good night. Good luck, everybody. Good night.